Welcome to Wellington today as you join us in person here and also online as we worship God together. I'm going to invite Peter up who's going to bring an announcement to us this morning. Peter, thank you. Morning everyone. Um, I just have uh, two announcements. The first is for those who are in the age bracket of 18 to 30, so everybody else, apologies. Uh, but the um, Christian Institute in Northern Ireland are running an event in the Denadry Hotel on the 27th uh, of April at half seven. It's called uh, Transforming Truths. There's going to be a number of keynote kind of speakers at that, and they're going to be looking at kind of how the Christian faith has impacted the world around us and how the Bible calls us to be salt and light in a secular society and how we seek uh, to do that. And so if you're 18 to 30, I'd really encourage you to think about going along uh, to that event on the 27th of April. If you want to know more information about that, come and speak to myself or speak to Eleanor and we'll uh, get you more information and point you in the right direction. So uh, if you're 18 to 30, I'd really encourage you to consider going along to that. And then the, the second thing, just really quickly, uh, is about the Hope Explored. Uh, we've been talking about this for the last uh, number of weeks. It starts this Tuesday night. We're really excited about that. We've about 16 people signed up already. Ready, uh, to come along, but it's not too late. If you're someone who, who wants to explore what uh, we as Christians believe, if you want to explore the hope that we believe is found in Christ, if you want somewhere that you can just go and ask questions, uh, and those questions will hopefully be answered to the best of our ability, then I'd really encourage you, get yourself signed up. Or maybe you know somebody, maybe you have a neighbor, you have a family member, somebody that you work with, someone you go to school with, uh, maybe they have lots of questions, uh, and this would be a really uh, good thing for them to be a part of. I'd really encourage you, get yourself signed up, or get them signed up, and bring them along with you. There's a number of ways you can do that. You can sign up in the vestibule at the back on the sign-up sheets, uh, or there, there's QR codes at the end of every pew. You can scan that. It'll take you uh, to a website. Just click on Hope Explored and get yourself signed up. And I'd really encourage you, be praying for us as we run this over the next three Tuesday nights. We're really encouraged uh, about the number that have signed up, and, and we're really praying that God would move in people's lives and transform their lives as, as we explain to them the hope that we believe is found in Christ. So I'd really encourage you to be praying for that over the next three Tuesday nights. Thanks, Thanks very much, Peter. To you I call, O Lord, my rock. What a wonderful opportunity we have to cry out to the Lord who is our rock. I don't know what's going on in your life at the moment. I don't know how fragile you feel today. But if the Lord is our rock, our foundation, then everything we do today can be couched in the security that God brings to us. We want to worship Him and praise Him. 
Let's stand together with awake, awake, O Zion, and then God so loved the world.
ask Linda to come up and do the children's talk this morning. Maybe the boys and girls would like to join us at the front as well. Thank you. What do you like to make? Um, I like making <coughs> pictures. Pictures, brilliant. Love making pictures too. Super. Well, I have a couple of wee things in my box that we like to make in our house, and I wonder if you like to make any of these in your house. Let's see. What's I have Lego? Who likes I making have Lego? I have you have this one. Brilliant. Yeah. It's a good fireboat. And what do you need? What did we need in our house to make this fireboat? What did we need? What did we need? Lego. Yeah, we needed Lego, didn't we? we certain, lots of Lego, lots of different colours of Lego, different shapes, different sizes, lots of different bits of Lego. Okay, brilliant. Let's see. Now, over Easter, Tobin went to a wee workshop, didn't you? And he made a minion. Do you know what that minion's made out of? What's it made out of, Tobin? Clay. And what did you need to make this minion? Yellow, lots of different colours of clay, yes. Yeah. So we need lots of different colours of cl clay. Oh, and orange for the, the pencil, yes, we need the pencil too. So we needed lots of different colours of clay to make this. Mm, this is a good one here. I wonder, did anybody make any of these with some of their Easter eggs? What's this? Easter What are those? Bunny. Yeah, little Rice Krispie buns. Has anybody made Rice Krispie buns before? Mm, they're good for using up some of the Easter eggs, aren't they? What, so what did I need to make? What did I need to make? Chocolate. We needed chocolate. We did. And what else? Judah, what else did I need? Rice Krispies. I did. And look at us all fancy with Maltesers on top of our Rice Krispie buns. Mm. So all those things that we were making, I needed something else to make them, didn't I? Whatever you make, even if it's just pictures, we need a piece of paper or we need pencils. We always need something to start with. And whatever we start with, it can change into something completely different. Tobin's clay just started with a big lump of yellow clay and a big lump of blue clay. And by the end, he had finished and he had made this minion. But we all, they all needed something to start with. And the last time I was up here with you, we talked about in the book of John, it started with the words, in the beginning. And you were able to tell me that day, what other book in the Bible starts with the words, in the beginning? John. Genesis, right back at the start, at the very beginning, we read about God making everything in the world. But this is where it's a bit different because when God made everything in the world, he started with nothing. And that's quite hard for us to imagine, isn't it? There was absolutely nothing there, just God. So he started, there was nothing there, and all he had to do was he had to speak, and all these amazing things were created. He didn't need to take anything else. He just spoke, and he made this beautiful world that we live in. He made all these amazing things that we're going to be singing about in our song later on. He made the stars in outer space. He made the leaves that fall, the grass that grows. He made the leaves, or he made the water. All the things that he made, God created them out of nothing. He just spoke and he made the most beautiful, beautiful world. And when he had made this beautiful world, he didn't just stop there. He didn't make this beautiful world just for him to enjoy looking at. He made this beautiful world for people to live in. Who was the first person that lived? Who? Adam, that's right, Adam and Eve. Adam was the first person that was on in this beautiful world. And God made this beautiful world for him to live in and enjoy. And that's where the creation gets a little bit different because this time, instead of just speaking and 
God creating Adam, it says he formed Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. So that means that God breathed his breath into Adam and he became this living person to live. That's how special he is. He's even more special than all the amazing things that God created on this, um, on this earth on this earth and you think like our creation our world is a really amazing place it shows just how creative God is because you think God out of nothing he created these big tall giraffes with big long necks he created this ocean with little tiny tiny creatures right up to the big mass of whales he created butterflies that started out as little caterpillars he created all those amazing things and that is nothing compared to how creative he is with you, what he has made you to be. And he has a special story written for you and he's given us this beautiful world to live in and to live that story out. And while we might not live in the perfection of Eden anymore, because Adam and Eve disobeyed God, didn't they, when they lived in this beautiful place of Eden? Because that's where God put Adam. Whenever he made Adam, he created this beautiful garden of Eden for him to live in. And while we might not live in that perfect Eden anymore, we just have to look at this beautiful world around us and we can see how amazing God's creation is. We think of all the beautiful things he's given us in this beautiful world for us to live in and enjoy. And that should make us want to worship him and praise him because he's made this beautiful world for us. He loves us all so much that he gave us this beautiful world to live in and to enjoy. And that's what we're gonna do in a wee minute. We're gonna sing to him to say thank you for all the the amazing things that he made. But another way to worship him is to pray to him and say thank you for those things as well. So that's what we're gonna do first before we sing our song. So we all close our eyes and we'll pray to God. Dear God, we thank you for this beautiful world that you have made. Thank you for the beauty that is all around us. Thank you for the trees and the flowers and the mountains and the beaches and all the amazing animals. God, we thank you that you love us so much that you gave us this beautiful world to live in. Would you help us to do our best to play our part in looking after it? And God, we thank you for every boy and girl here today. God, we thank you for just how much you love them. We thank you for how unique and how special they are and the story that you have written for them. So God, I pray that you would be with us now as we go to the well and to Totsome and that we would learn more about you today. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, so we're gonna stand up now and we are gonna sing Creator God. We're gonna sing about all those amazing things that God has created. So up you get and we get a few people up to do actions. Yeah. Right, anybody that wants to do actions, come on on up. Come on up, you can help me. Oh, lots of helpers today, that's great. Come on up, perfect.
Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. And we ask, Lord, that as we continue to worship, that your Holy Spirit would move upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you turn with me, please, to Genesis 1? Beginning to read at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless, empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and He separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And it was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. And God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters He called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with its seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. And the Lord produced vegetation and plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And they also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give it light on the earth, to govern the day and night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the waters teemed according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas. And let the birds increase on the earth, and there was evening, and there was morning on the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our own image in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves in the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, and they will be your foods. 
and to all the beasts of the earth and to all the birds of the air and the creatures that move in the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, in these moments, may you pour your Holy Spirit upon us for illumination, appreciation, and application. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We are so privileged because we understand the significance of the first sentence of the Bible in a way that those early on may not. In the beginning, God. Well, God who? If you are introduced to this earth with little knowledge of anything that has happened, you suddenly appear as a human being. And God comes and walks in the middle of the garden. Well, who are you, God? What a journey those first human beings must have had. Today we read all sorts of theologies back into our understanding of the nature and character of God. But not so the first generation. For them, this was going to be a discovery. They were going to have to get to know this God whatever name he introduced himself by. They were going to have to try to appreciate why they had been brought into this world, what their purpose in this world actually was. And in the Old Testament, we have 1,500 years of them grappling with the knowledge about God. We can't have 1,500 years in perhaps a few sessions or months, we will try to grapple with their growing awareness of this God, what it meant to get to know Him, what He wanted from them, the defining moments in the lives of people in the Old Covenant, preparing us for a new people. In the beginning, God. Three things today as we prepare for this evening, and that is that we see the first introductions here of getting to know this God's character, His desires, His powers. And the first is that we have a God of power and order. Power and order. In the beginning, God created. And, and the Hebrew word there, it can be, there is a discussion over how we should understand the word, the Hebrew word created, which can mean make or separate. In the NIV, and unlike most translations, they have included both make, as in created and separated. But what it tells us about God is that He has power. That's the very first introduction 
that any human being gets to their knowledge and theology of God. He is a powerful being. Thank God for that. That He is a God of power that can create out of nothing. Ex annihilo. When we look at the world, when we look out at the expanse of the universe, that was God. He declares who He is. In the beginning, God created. Those two words brought very close together in the same sentence. He is a subject of the verb in this verse. It is about God and God's power to make, to create, to form. We are in the presence of a God of such power today. The universe and the expanse of this universe only give us an inkling into the power behind such a God. This is an expression of His power, but we have not even seen Him in all His glory. Even Jesus Christ veiled the glory of God when He was incarnate. But the God who exists, that holds everything, the visible manifestation of His power we see in creation only is the tip of the iceberg. In the beginning, actually the Hebrew, the way that that's formed, means more in terms of in the beginning of God's divine action. So we're not actually told about this God prior to this moment. But God is introducing Himself here in His divine action. This is the first that we're getting to know about Him. It is the divine in action. And he is always in action. But he decides that he's going to form the universe that we see. And so he's a God of power. But he's also a God of order. How many times do we read here that he separates out various things? And God created the heavens and the earth, and now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God created the heavens and the earth. And interestingly, here we have, even in this first expression of separation, separating out, that the Spirit of God was over the surface of the deep, was hovering over the waters. Why is that significant? Because when God separates out, He then fills. He fills the space between heaven and earth at this moment because the Spirit of God is going to do something powerful He's going to now begin to create things that you and I see and derive benefit from. He is going to breathe life into everything that is formed so that it grows. He is the God of life. He has promised us life. And as He separates out, as God, the first person of the Trinity, separates out, He allows the third person of the Trinity to hover over the space that has been created. And God is going to fill that space so that what is formed there is good. And then we see how He continues these acts of separation. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And He separated the light from the darkness. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and called dry ground. And so it was. And God called the dry ground land and gathered the waters 
he called the sea, and God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with its seed in it according to their kinds. And now he's creating kinds. He's separating the various kinds out into categories. This is a God of divine order separating out what needs to be separated and dividing things into particular groupings and categories in order to establish divine order in those things that he is making and creating. And as a result of that, investing in those things that he has created, the capacity to multiply, to bear fruit with its seed, And then every living and moving thing in verse 20, with which the waters team according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the sea. Again, what he's creating with a divine order, separating the various things out, then investing in what he has made, the capacity to reproduce, the capacity to multiply so that his created order continues to flourish, continues to grow. And it is then epitomized in the creation of humanity. In verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. And he established Adam and Eve. Again, look at what happens in the formation of Eve. He separates out from Adam's body a rib to make Eve. Only God has the power of divine separation, the capacity to separate appropriately in such a way as that it benefits those who experience such power. And then he gave them a particular task to actually go forth and multiply. Why? Because in doing so, those that would multiply were to reflect his image too. This is a God who's creating out of divine order for divine reasons in power, separating out. But then also, he is the God who is uniting. But for Adam, in verse chapter 2, verse 20, So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs, closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of a man. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, that they become one flesh. Not only is there a separation that's happening, according to divine order. There is now a uniting that is taking place according to the divine order. There is a union being formed. These passages tell us something hugely significant that will set a pattern for the rest of all Scripture. 
And that is that our God is powerful, that our God creates, that our God produces divine order, and that our God has not only the power to separate and define what that should look like, but our God has the power to unite and define also how that should happen and what that should look like. And that continues to manifest itself right throughout the Old Covenant. Why do you think the purity laws exist? Why do you think God establishes certain rules about purity that are necessary? Because He is separating out. Why do you think God calls for Himself a people amongst other peoples? Because God is separating out what he believes to be important and how he wishes to retain divine order by creating such separations. How he wants this divine order of separation between light and darkness, between what is holy and unholy, so that it reflects his image as a God that is whole. And that's why unity is important. That's why Jesus prays for it in John chapter 17, even regarding his own people, that he separates out from the world, that they be one as we are one. God defines unity. And therefore, when human beings decide what they will separate from and define it, when they decide what they will divide, then if we encroach upon his divine order, his principles of separation and unity, we do so at our peril. And finally, God separated out one more thing. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Same word, because holiness is about separation. He made it holy. He made it distinct. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. We need to tie these things together as they are biblically done, as God creates divine order. And... The reality is that when it comes to that final day, he is separating that day out from the other six. The continuity in this is wonderful. God is not only separating out the heavens from the earth, not only separating light from darkness, not only separating the waters the act of separation itself is also seen in creating one day separate from the other days. And that day is to be a day of rest, but it's also to be a day that is unlike the other days. It is to be a day which is essentially different. So if we break that divine order of separation, whatever day that is chosen to be, the result is that it is not good for us. It does not aid our rest. God established a rest. If we break it, then it impacts how we live as believers. It impacts our relationship with God. It impacts our relationship with others as a consequence. If we do not separate ourselves from the world and how they live, it has an impact on our fellowship with God and our fellowship with each other. If we do anything to divide what God has established or to form our own rules of those we separate from and how we seek to do that, if it is against his divine order, it has an impact upon our relationship with him and our relationship with with each other. Creation itself is beginning to establish these principles of divine order. In fact, it's clearly seen even when they reflect upon it later in the Psalms. 
If you want to turn with me to Psalm 19 and read what the psalmist reflects upon as he thinks about creation itself. Psalm 19, page 552. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words are to the ends of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at the one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, much more than pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the word of my mouth And the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Even the psalmist in the midst of that is saying that God has created these things. He has declared his glory. But his glory for us is also revealed in the laws that he imparts, in the principles and precepts that he asks us to engage in. He has separated these things out so that we understand more about him. Two other things. Because tonight we're going to look at the impact that sin had upon these things. He created something of beauty. Not only did God begin a creative powerful work, but at the end of all of that, he created for himself human beings, and he separated out not only Eve from Adam, but he separated out and made a distinction between Adam and Eve as a living creation and everything else. Whilst everything else was to go forth and multiply or reproduce in some way, whether it was the seeds uh, of the the ground in terms of um, the the trees or the the fish in the sea, uh, living creatures, human beings were placed at a very different level in that divine order. Because in it, he then says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant. What a wonderful expression, I give you. the God of power, the God of divine order, the God that brought all of the intricacies of the planet together and the formation of the the world around us gave us the beauty of it. It is then epitomized in bringing them together in that garden of Eden. where he, they looked at the trees 
and saw that it was good and good to eat. The appreciation of that moment that God had provided for them, not only a place to live, but a way of being sustained. And then he gave them himself. It wasn't enough that this creation was experienced in a place of divine order and nutrition and a place of authority to go and replicate what God had created and to keep the order of all of that together as they ruled over it with the same love that God had established it. But God then did something quite spectacular. In chapter 3, verse 8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What a wonderful way to picture what God is doing as he's making himself known. This God, so powerful, creating such an expansive universe of his divine actions, separating out things that could not be separated unless God did, uniting things that only God could unite, creating something for their pleasure, a tree of life. As they would look out, as the psalmist in Psalm 19 said, no matter your language or speech, you know that there's something quite majestic in the skies above. And they had, God had created everything that was beautiful, everything that was good. And then he took form and walked in the garden. Now, we don't know how that happened. We don't know how God enabled that action, but it was significant and sufficient for Adam or who reflected upon it to say that God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Can you imagine that moment? Now, we recognize that they have fallen. So it's not a pleasant experience after that moment. But one can assume that it was before. And why do we say that? Because this isn't the first time that he must have appeared, or they would have had no idea of what was happening. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. Well, how did they know it wasn't an animal? How did they know? Because they knew the difference. This was the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Oh, this amazing God, this mighty God, who is beginning this divine action, now wants to personally be present. Personally be present. How amazing that God, after all the power, demonstrates a love and humility that said, I won't be separate or distinct from those that I have created. I want to be with them. It's not good enough for the first, second, and third person of the Trinity to simply be bonded to one another. And we can be, and we're totally sufficient, and we do not need to create, but we lovingly do so because we get joy out of seeing what we have created that is good. And we love the fact that out of Adam, we produced Eve, so that as equals, they could share such love. And we want to visit it because we enjoy it and therefore walking in the garden, established their presence 
with those that they had created. It was a place of joy, a place of beauty, a place of peace, of prosperity, of pleasure. It was a place of love. Before what we talk about this evening changed all of that, when Adam and Eve looked in each other's eyes, they saw the Creator God because He had familiarized Himself with them as He walked with them. He had declared who He was, and He wanted to establish that relationship with them. And He gave them boundaries. You keep these boundaries, all is well. You break them, there'll be consequences. I am a God of order. And when it's broken, bad things happen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in these moments, may your grace still continue to fall upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's us respond to God as well. Ancient of days, and then the Lord Almighty reigns.
Son and Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore.